But let's turn to Psalm 119 and uh, just read that section of verses there between 105 and 112. Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have sworn, and I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy word. Accept, I beseech thee, the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me thy judgments. My soul is continually in my hand, yet do I not forget thy law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I erred not from thy precepts. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined mine heart to perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. Thomas Manton on that particular verse, verse 106. In the former verse, verse 105, David had commended the word for a sure direction. It is a light and a lamp. How so? Not only by God's designation and appointment, but by David's choice. It was a light to my feet and a lamp to my steps. Now in this verse he speaks of his firmness and constancy to that choice. I have taken thy word for my guidance and direction. And there he did resolve to stick. His constancy was grounded upon a vow or upon a promissory oath which he saw no cause to retract or repent of. That oath is in verse 106. I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgments. In these words you may observe first the strength of David's resolution and purpose expressed in his oath. Not I must or I will keep, but I have sworn. The matter of this purpose or oath is the second point, and that was to keep God's judgments. Third observation is one great motive and reason that inclined him so to do in the word, thy righteous judgments, the marvelous equity that was to be observed in the things commanded by God. Fourth observation, the conscience that lay upon him of observing this oath. I will perform it, he says, as if he had said, I saw a great deal of reason to make the promise so solemnly to God, and I see no reason at all to retract it. Four points I shall observe. First, that it is not only lawful, but good and profitable to bind ourselves to our duty by a vow, solemnly declared purpose, and holy oath. So, David, I have sworn. Second, that this help, this help of an oath or vow, should be used in a matter lawful, weighty, and necessary. I have sworn, saith David, but what hath he sworn? To keep thy righteous judgments, a great duty which God had enjoined him in his covenant. Third point, those that are entered into the bond of an holy oath must religiously observe and perform what they have sworn to God. I have sworn and I will perform. Fourth, that we may perform our oaths and lie under a sense and conscience of our engagements to God, it is good that they should be often revived and renewed upon us. For so doth David here recognize his oath, I have sworn. He's renewing his oath. The first doctrine that we might learn here, that it concerns us sometimes to bind ourselves to God and the duty that we owe him by an oath. And this will be displayed in three uh, sections, that it is lawful, that it is convenient, and that it is profitable to do so. <clears throat> First, that it is lawful. <clears throat> that it is lawful so to do appears from God's injunction and the practice of the saints. 
First, from God's injunction, he hath commanded us to accept of the gospel covenant, and not barely so, but to submit unto the seals and rites by which it is confirmed, which submission of ours implieth an oath made to God. Now, there's a few Latin words here, and I'm not going to say them. I'm just going to skip over them. He usually uh, uh, explains them in English anyways. Baptism is our sacramental vow, our oath of allegiance to God. And therefore, it is called in 1 Peter 3.21, the answer of a good conscience towards God. An answer upon God's demands in the covenant. God does, as it were, in the covenant of grace, put us to the question, will you renounce all your sins and all the vanities you have doted upon? And we answer to God, enter into a solemn oath that we will renounce sin, that we will accept of Christ as our Savior and will walk before him in all holy obedience. Among the Romans, when any soldier was pressed for war, he took an oath to serve his captain faithfully, and not to forsake him. And then he was called a soldier by sacrifice or by oath. And sometimes one took an oath for all the rest, and the others only said, the same, the same oath he took, the same do I. Thus every Christian is a professed soldier of Christ. He hath sworn to become the Lord's, to cleave faithfully to him, and this oath, that it may be not forgotten, is renewed at the Lord's Supper, where we again solemnly engage by the public rites that are there used to stand to our covenant. We do not only come and take God's pledge out of God's hands to be assured of the privileges of the covenant, but we bind ourselves to perform the duty thereof. For as the blood of the beast in Exodus 24 that was offered in the sacrifice which is called there the blood of the covenant, was sprinkled not only upon the altar to show that God was engaged to bless, but it was sprinkled half upon the people to show they were engaged to obey. There was a confirmation of that promise made to God. All that the Lord hath commanded us, that will we do. Well now, if God thought such a course necessary and profitable for us, certainly, we may upon occasion use the like means for our confirmation, for our strengthening in the work of obedience, that there is such a vow expressed or implied in every prayer, may be easily made good in the whole tenor of our Christianity. Therefore, certainly it is lawful to do so. To make our duty more urgent and explicit upon our souls, by solemn vow and serious oath of dedication of ourselves to God's use and service. Practice of the saints who have publicly and privately engaged themselves to God do show the lawfulness of it. Public instances, examples, 1st, 2nd Chronicles uh, 15, 12 to 14, They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and soul, and they swear unto the Lord. So in Josiah's time, 2 Chronicles 34, 31, And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and keep his commandments. Nehemiah 10, 29, They entered into an oath to walk in God's laws. And for private oaths, Oaths, we have David's instance here in the text. And Job 31.1, I made a covenant with mine eyes, he says. He had bound himself by a holy vow and purpose to guard his senses and take heed. His heart did not take fire by the gazing of his eye, and that it was not inflamed with lust and sin. Second point It said the three points were that it is lawful, convenient, and profitable. Second point, that it is convenient to do so. To answer God's love and condescension to us in the covenant, God thinks he can never be bound fast enough to us. 
and therefore interposeth by an oath. An oath is properly conversant about a doubtful matter of which there is some question or scruple which cannot otherwise be decided. Then the law saith he should give his oath to his neighbor. Why then doth the Lord swear? Is there any doubtfulness in his promises? No, the apostle saith in Hebrews 6, 18, 16 to 18. Now read from that. Hebrews 6, 16 to 18. For ver men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of strife, end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Why doth the, then the Lord swear? Is there any doubtfulness in his promises? The Lord swears, being willing over and above to give the heirs of promise ample satisfaction. Now for God that cannot lie, and whose word is above all assurance, to stoop to us and put himself to an oath, certainly this should work upon our hearts and draw from us some answerable return on our part, there being great and visible danger of our breaking with God, not of his breaking with us. Therefore, that we may not play fast and loose with him, we should come under this engagement to him of vow and public promise to God. Second, to testify our affection to his service, we should put ourselves under the most high and sacred bonds that can be found out. Many have some slight and wandering emotions towards God and cold purposes of serving him, which soon vanish and come to nothing. But now it argueth the heart is more thoroughly bent and set towards God that and that we have a deep sense of our duty when we seriously confirm our purpose by a vow and a holy oath. There are diverse sorts of men in the world, some that are of that spirit as to break all bonds, cast away all cords, and think they can never be loose enough in point of religion. Example in Psalm 2, verse 2, The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. They seek to deface and blot out of their conscience the natural sense which they have of religion and of their duty to God, and so to give up themselves headlong unto all manner of impiety. There are others who have some cold approbation of the way of God and which manifests itself by some faint, weak, and wavering purposes and slight attempts upon religion, but are soon discouraged and never come to a fixed resolution or serious dedication or surrender of themselves to the Lord's use. Now a gracious heart thinks that it can never be bound fast enough to God Therefore doth not only approve the ways of God or desire to walk therein, but issues forth a purpose, a practical decree in his soul. Besides the approbation of conscience, there is a, a, a desire of heart. And this desire, backed with a purpose, and this promise backed with an oath, which is the highest way of obligation, and thus doth he dedicate himself to the Lord and his service in the strictest way of expressing his consent. For an oath binds more than a promise. Third matter, lawful, convenient, profitable. This is profitable. It is very profitable to do so. 
Because of our backwardness, laziness, and fickleness. Because of our backwardness, we need to thrust forth the heart into the ways of obedience. For we hang off from God. Though we are His by every kind of right and title, yet we are very slow of heart to do His will. And therefore an oath is profitable to increase the sense of our duty. A threefold cord is not easily broken. Now, there is a triple tie and a bond upon man. There is God's natural right that he hath over us and to our service, the sovereignty and dominion that he hath over us. We are not free as to obedience before the oath, but are bound by creation. For God hath created us not only as he created other things, ultimately and terminatively, but immediately for his service. All things were created for his glory, so that ultimately they are for his use, but the proper end and use wherefore man was created was for the immediate service of God. He that planted the vine expected fruit from it. By continual preservation he giveth us maintenance and therefore justly expecteth service. By redemption, as having bought us with a dear price, 1 Corinthians 6, ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. From all which there resulteth a natural duty, which we owe to him as our sovereign, and he may command us what he will. There is the bond of voluntary consent, that our duty may be more active than urging upon our hearts. God doth not only interpose his own authority and command us to keep his laws diligently, Psalm uh, 119.4, but requires a consent on the creature's part. All the treaties and tenders of grace are made to draw us to this consent, that we may voluntarily and by the inclination of our own hearts present ourselves before the Lord and yield up ourselves to his service. We read Romans 6.13. 6, 12, and 13. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Third, besides this, there is the bond of an oath, which is the strictest way of voluntary resolution and highest engagement that a man can make Therefore, when the heart is so backward and hangs off from God and duties we owe to him, it is good to declare our assent in the most solemn way. That the saints have made use of purposes thus solemnly declared in case of backwardness appears in Scripture. David, when his heart was shy of God's presence and had sinned away his liberty and peace and so could not endure to come to God, what course did he take? He issues forth a practical decree in his soul and binds his heart by a fixed purpose that he would come to God. Psalm 32, 5 I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. And Acts 11:23. And who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. He exhorted them with full purpose of heart to draw nigh to God. It should be the fixed resolution of the soul. Jeremiah thirty twenty one. Who is this that engaged his heart to approach unto me, saith the Lord? We should lay the strongest bonds and engagements we possibly can, whereby God's authority may be backed and his right confirmed by the most solemn assent that we can make. In regard of our fickleness and inconstancy, we are slippery. We are off and on with God. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. James 1.8 We have unsettled hearts. And when we meet with temptations from without, we shall soon give up at the first assault. And so be now for God and then for Satan. 
Therefore, this is a lawful and sanctified means to help us to constancy. Indeed, before we come to this fixed, settled purpose, we lie open to temptation. And when our first heats are spent, we tire and wax weary in the Lord's service. Therefore, we had need to make the most sacred engagements to God, that we may keep to God and persist in our duty. Now, a solemn oath seems to be the most serviceable for this use. Why? For it implies a severe and dreadful implication. In an oath, God is not only invoked as a witness, but as a judge. We appeal to his omnisciency for the sincerity of our hearts in making promise and to his vindictive power as a judge if we shall act contrary to what we have sworn. Plutarch says, Every oath implies a curse or a desire of vengeance in case of the breach of that oath. Therefore it is said in Nehemiah 10.29, they entered into a curse to walk in God's law. That is, a curse in case of disobedience. And this was supposed to be the beginning of that right by which they were wont to confirm their covenants. Jeremiah 34.18, when the calf was cut in twain, they did, as it were, devote themselves thus to be cut in twain and torn in pieces and to be destroyed as that creature was if they violated the covenant thus solemnly sworn. And though this imprecation or execration should not be expressed, yet every promissory oath necessarily implies a curse in case of unfaithfulness. Well. Now this is a good means to keep us constant when we have bound ourselves to God upon such strict terms. Therefore, some say it is to hedge because it is as a hedge to keep us within the compass of our duty and confirm our hearts in that which is good. Well, because of our fickleness, it is not enough to leave the soul to the, the mere bonds of duty but confirm our resolution by an oath. I may illustrate this by that passage when Hooper, the blessed martyr, was at the stake. The officers came to fasten him to it, saith he, Let me alone. God hath called me hither. He will keep me from stirring. And yet, because I am but flesh and blood, I am willing. Tie me fast, lest I stir. So we may say in this case that though the authority of God commanding his right in us and sovereignty over us is reason enough to enforce the duty we owe to him and bind the heart and sway the conscience, yet because of the weakness of our hearts, we should make this bond the more urging upon us by a solemn consent, thus ratified and confirmed by the solemnity of an oath, vow or promise made to God. Third, it will be very profitable because of our laziness. By resolution we are quickened to more seriousness and diligence. When a man hath the bond of an oath upon him, then he will make a business of religion, whereas otherwise he will make but a sport and a thing that he only regards by the by. The by. Oh, but when his heart is fixed, this is the thing he will look after. Psalm 27. Verse 4 says, A one thing have I desired of the Lord, that I, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. When our heart is set upon a thing, we will follow it close. And when it is so set upon a thing, as that we have bound ourselves by the strictest bonds we can lay upon our heart, it will engage us more seriously. The second doctrine, that this help of an oath or holy vow should be used in a matter lawful, weighty, and necessary. In a matter lawful, there is a vow and a covenanting, and that which is evil as those that bound themselves with a curse that they would not eat or drink until they had killed Paul, Acts 23. And many will make a vow and promise with themselves that they will never forgive their neighbor, such and such an offense. 
And we read of a covenant made with death and hell, whether it be meant of the king of Babylon or no, as he is called death, and hell by the prophet. Some evil covenant is intended thereby, and thus a vow is made the bond of iniquity and must be broken rather than kept, or indeed it must be not made. To vow that which is sinful, this is like the hire of a whore or the price of a dog offered to the Lord for a vow. Deuteronomy 23. It must be in a matter weighty, necessary, and acceptable unto God. There are two things come under our oath and vow. First, that which is our necessary work, religious obedience to God in the way of his commandment. For this is not a rash and unnecessary vow, but that we are sworn to in baptism. This is that which David promiseth here, I have sworn, and I will perform it, to keep thy righteous judgments. And this is the vow which Jacob made, though there was something of a particularity he adds to it. Genesis 28, 20. But the substance of it was this, if the Lord will be with me and keep me in this way that I go, then shall the Lord be my God. There are many that will vow and promise trifles, and so infringe their own Christian liberty, and needlessly bind themselves in chains of their own making, where God hath left them free. This help is for weighty things of Christianity, not for by-matters. Those monkish bylaws that have filled the world with superstition, not with religion, while they have been only conversant about some indifferent things as pilgrimages, abstinences from meats and marriages, wherein they place the height of Christian perfection. Second, helps to obedience. Such things as we shall find to be helps and do conduce to the removal of impediments, such should come under a vow and solemn promise to God. Job again in 31.1, I made a covenant with my eyes. That was a help to the preserving of his chastity and that he would not allow himself to gaze, to take a view of the beauty of others. And the apostle, when it was for the glory of God, makes a vow or a kind of solemn promise that he would take no maintenance in Achaia. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 10. He solemnly binds himself that he might not hinder the progress of the gospel. So when we find our heart ready to betray us by this or that evil occasion, we may, in this case, interpose a vow and a promise. But then with this caution, that we do not unreasonably destroy our Christian liberty and so occasion a snare to our souls and that we do not think this to be a perfect cure of these distempers while we neglect the main things. As many will make a vow to play no more at such a game, or drink no more at such a house, or use such a creature, or come into such a particular company, and so place all their religion in these things. This is but like cutting off the branches when the root remains, or stopping one hole in a leaky or ruinous ship and vessel when everywhere it is ready to let in water upon it, and to be broken in pieces. Therefore, when you rest in those by-matters without resolving to cleave to God in a course of obedience, but like mending a hole in the wall of a house when the whole building is on fire, or troubling ourselves with a sore finger when we are languishing of a consumption, it is but stopping this or that particular sin when the whole soul lies under the power and slavery of the kingdom of Satan. Objection. But here a doubt may arise. How can I promise to keep God's law since it is not in my power to do it exactly? It is impossible. The answer, when David saith, I have sworn, he speaks not from presumption of his own strength, but only declareth the sense of his duty and useth his oath as a sanctified means to bind his heart to God. And therefore it is not to exclude the power of God's grace or to presume of his own strength. God's assistance is best expected in God's way. Such vows and promises, they are always to be interpreted to be made in the sense of the covenant of grace, for no particular voluntary or accessory covenant of ours can take away the general covenant 
wherein we stand engaged to God, but rather it must be included in it. Therefore, when David saith, I will keep thy righteous judgments, he means according to the sense of the covenant of grace, that is, expecting help for duties and pardon and failing. As expecting help from God, for so the new covenant gives strength to observe what it requires. The law enforceth duty. The covenant of grace helps us to perform the duty required of us. The gospel, it is a ministration of the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3. And therefore promissory oaths, according to the sense of the new covenant, are made with a confidence upon the Lord's strength and assistance in seeking pardon for his failings. Infirmities may stand with the covenant of grace, provided we crave mercy and recover ourselves by repentance, and so make no final breach with God. Therefore, this is a keeping according to the measure of grace received, and as human frailty will permit. Briefly, then, when are sins to be looked upon as infirmities and not as perjuries and breach of the covenant? Answer, when we would not voluntarily yield to the least sin, but in case of great sin we grow more watchful, more humble, more holy, when our falls are such as David's, when he had fallen foully, Psalm 51, 6, Now thou shalt make me to know wisdom. When upon our failings we are more ashamed of ourselves, more afraid of our weakness, more earnest to renew our former resolutions, more careful to wait upon God for grace to perform what he hath required of us, more watchful, more circumspect, when we begin to grow wise by our own smarting, in such cases an oath is not broken. Look, as every failing of the wife doth not dissolve the marriage covenant, so every failing on our part doth not dissolve the covenant between God and us. And therefore, though there will be some infirmities, but yet when we are careful to sue out our pardon in the name of Christ Jesus, and you shall by your failings be more watchful, circumspect, and then we keep the covenant in a gospel sense. Third doctrine, that when we have sworn obedience to God, we must religiously perform and observe what we have sworn to God. Psalm 76.11, Vow and pay unto the Lord. When we come under the bond of a vow, we must be careful to make payment. It is a binding upon the heart. See how it is expressed in Numbers 30, verse 2. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. When we have bound ourselves with a bond, that is, when we have increased our bonds, for the ingeminating words in the Hebrew doth exceedingly increase the sense. When a man is bound upon a bond, he should not play fast and loose with God, but be very careful to perform what he has sworn. God on his part has sworn to the covenant, and he is constant in all his promise, and he certainly expects the like constancy from us, especially when we are so deeply bound, not only by his laws and obligation of his mercies, but by the solemn consent of our own vows. We have bound ourselves then to keep them, whether we will or no. Now, what reasons are there why we must perform? First reason, the same motives that inclined us at first to take our oath should persuade us to keep it, whatever falls out. After trial, we shall see no cause to repent of our resolution. For God is ever the same that he was, and his commands are ever the same in all his righteous judgments, holy, just, good profitable to the creature. Christians, if we meet with any change in our outward condition, any new impediments, oppositions, and discouragements that we were not aware of when we first entered into our oath, it was our rashness, for we should sit down and count the charges. We should allow for it. The first article of the new covenant was that we should deny ourselves. Matthew 16. And after vows, we should not make inquiry, but before the vows. Proverbs 20, 25. 
When we are bound, we must take our lot and hazard, and whatever comes, we must perform them to God. Second, because our oath is a further aggravation of our sin, therefore better never swear than not to keep it. Ecclesiastes 5, 5, better it is that thou shouldest not vow, than vow and not pay. God is mocked by an oath and a covenant when it is not observed. A man that refuseth to be enlisted doth not meet with the like punishment as he that runs from his colors. So he that never came under the oath of God doth not sin so much as he that has sworn to his covenant. That which is but simple fornication in the Gentiles, in Christians, it is adultery, breach of vow. Indeed, in things that are absolutely and indispensably necessary to salvation, we are bound to consent. Yes. But when a consent thus thus solemnly made is broken, it aggravates the sin. But when we shall be like the man in the gospel that was possessed with the devil, whom no chains could hold fast, when neither the bond of duty nor the bonds of our own oaths and engagements will hold us, but we break all cords, the greater is our rebellion and disobedience to God. Third, therefore we must perform the obedience that we have sworn to God, because God hath ever been a severe and just avenger of breach of covenants. By way of argument, lesser to greater, those made with man, and therefore certainly he will avenge his covenant, so solemnly made with himself. And everywhere in Scripture you'll find it is propounded as a sure mark of vengeance when one man hath sworn to another and hath called upon the Most High God to confirm that covenant that he makes with him, there be a failure, a trespass, though it be in point of omission, God hath avenged that covenant. An instance for this you have in Amos 1, verse 9. For three transgressions of Tyrus and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom, and they remembered not the brotherly covenant. Tyrus and Judah, they were in covenant with one another, a mutual league offensive and defensive that were solemnly sworn. Now, though God had many causes of his vengeance and many quarrels with Tyrus because of their idolatries, but chiefly because of breach of covenant, they forgot the friendship that was between the children of Israel and Judah and did not assist the people of Judah as they should and were bound to, suffered them to be led into captivity and spoiled by the Edomites and other nations. So for a sin of commission it is spoken as a mark of sore vengeance. Psalm 55 He hath put forth his hand against such as be at peace with him. He hath broken his covenant. In those federal transactions and oaths, that pass between man and man, God takes himself to be specially interested and will see that the breach of them be severely punished. The next step is not only between equals, but when a covenant hath been made with servants and poor underlings and would not set them free at the year of Jubilee, see how severely God threatens them. Jeremiah 34, 16-18 For the breach of it, even a covenant made with enemies, Ezekiel 17, 18 and 19, seeing he despised the oath by breaking the covenant, when, lo, he had given his hand and hath done all these things, he shall not escape. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, as I live, surely mine oath, that he hath despised, and my covenant that he hath broken, even it will I recompense upon his own head. Nay, carry it one gradation higher, though the covenant were extorted by fraud, as the covenant made with the Gibeonites in Joshua 9:19, they were part of the Canaanites, and God severely enjoined the Israelites they should cut off all these nations. Yet when they craftily got them into covenant, when this people were wronged by Saul, the Lord takes notice of it. 2 Samuel 21. See how God judgeth for them. There were three years of famine and pestilence, which was not appeased until Saul's sons were hanged before the sun. Now the Lord hath ever been such a severe avenger of an oath between man and man, between his people and their servants, between his people and their enemies. And when 
extorted from them certainly in such a solemn covenant as he hath made between us and himself, and that in things absolutely necessary, in things enjoined before the covenant was made, it is not safe to break with God. Ananias, when he vowed a thing to the Lord, though he was free before, God strikes him dead. It is not free with us. Take note of this. It is not free with us, whether we will obey, yes or no, yea or nay, what is enjoined upon us. Therefore, when we will break with God, what shall we expect but that he should avenge the quarrel of his covenant? Doctrine number four. I now come to the fourth point, that our oath of obedience to God should often be revived and renewed upon us. David recognizes and takes notice of the oath wherein he was bound to God, and here he renews it again. Verse 106, I will perform it. It should be so. First, because we are apt to forget and not to have such a lively sense of a thing long since done, so that we either break the oath or perform our duty very negligently. Our old baptismal covenant, we are apt to forget it, especially by being under the bond of it in innocency and dedicated to God by the act of another, such as our parents. The Apostle instances it in those that were baptized in grown years, 2 Peter 1.9, he intimates that they were apt to forget that they were purged from their old sins. I suppose it relates to baptism in that clause, forgotten his baptismal vow and obligation of renouncing his sin and giving himself to the service of the Lord. And therefore there should be a purpose to revive it upon our heart, and the obligation should ever be made new and fresh to quicken us to our duty. Second reason, this forgetfulness, it will cost us dear. It will be an occasion of many and great troubles. Jacob had forgotten his vows of building an altar at Bethel. God quickens him to his duty by sharp affliction. Genesis 35, 1, arise, go up to Bethel. God was fain to quicken him with a scourge. Samson When his vow was broken, how many dangers is he thrown into? Taken and bound and made a sport of by the Philistines. God will rub up the memories of his servants by some sharp and severe dispensations of his providence when they are not sensible of their vow and faith plighted to God. Never forget your obligation to God. Deuteronomy 4.23 Take heed to yourselves lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God. Question, but when should we renew our covenant or our oath of allegiance to God? First, partly when we stand in need of some special favor from God or when we draw nigh to him in some special duty, as Jacob, when God manifested himself to him and he had communion with him at Bethel. Then he vowed a vow in Genesis 28. Also in Numbers 21, Israel vowed a vow to the Lord when they were in some distress. In Psalm 66:14, I will pay the vows of my distress, which I made when I was in trouble. Again, after some special mercy, when under some love pang of spiritual rejoicing, and we have a deep sense of God's love to us, or a new pledge of his love to us, either in spiritual or temporal benefits, and our soul melted out towards God in acts of spiritual rejoicing. Psalm 116, 8, For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. And when God breaks the force and power of enemies, when he makes the wrath of man, in the story of Jonah, Third, when all things go to ruin, that's when we should renew our covenant. When the state of religion is collapsed, either in a nation or in our hearts, after some notable breaches of covenant by a people or by a person, 
that we have warped from God, seem to have wrested ourselves out of his arms, then to bind ourselves to him again and, and renew our vows. For upon this occasion doth Josiah enter into covenant with God and cause the people to stand to the oath. Second Chronicles 34. Fourth, when we are to draw nigh to God in the use of the seals of the new covenant. When a man is to revive his own right in the covenant of grace, so when we are to draw nigh to God in the Lord's Supper, which is the New Testament in Christ's blood, which is the seal of the covenant, then we should solemnly bind ourselves to the duty of it and swear unto the Lord anew. The use of this is to press you with all earnestness to enter into covenant with God. And then to keep it and make it good. To be sensible of the vow of God upon you and to keep firm in the bond of the holy oath. First, to enter into solemn obligation to God, a purpose of holy and close walking with God, I shall press unto you this. God's laws are holy, just, and good. Therefore, certainly, we should not be backward to swear to him because we cannot bring ourselves seriously to bring our, to give up ourselves to the Lord. They are righteous judgments. Suppose you could be free. Yet, subjection to God were to be chosen before liberty. Therefore, when Christ invites us to take his yoke upon ourselves, he doth not so much urge his authority as in all things are given to me of the of my father therefore come to me but he urgeth the sweetness of obedience and the pleasure we may find in coming to him Matthew 11:29 my yoke is easy and my burden is light if a man were free to choose whether he would be for god or not yet the perfection or well-being of the reasonable nature being so much concerned in obedience to God, you should choose those laws before liberty. What doth the Lord require of you? To be holy, just, temperate, often praying and praising his name. And are these things hard? A man is not a man if he does, do not yield to these things. I read from Titus 2, verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. All our duties are comprised in those three adverbs, soberly, righteously, godly. By being sober, a man delights himself, and by being just and righteous, a man delights others. Without this, the world would be like a den of thieves. And by being godly, he doth delight God. If we only had permission to love God and serve him, much more when we have a command to serve him, to be often in communion with him, it is the happiest life in the world. There is a great deal of pleasure, sweetness, and rational contentment doth accompany the exercise of these three graces, sobriety, Righteousness, godliness. The second reason, we are already obliged by God's command. So that whether you resolve or no, you are bound. There are some things that are left free in our own power before the vow passeth upon us. As in Acts chapter 5 verse 4, was it not in thy power? Yes. But there are other things that are not in our power. God's right over the creature is valid, whether he consent to it or no, as the natural relation doth infer and enforce duty without consent. This is the difference between voluntary and natural relations. Look, as a father is a father, whether the child own him or not, in that quality and relation and without his consent, a father as a father hath a right to command the child. But there are duties that depend upon our consent. As in the choice of a husband or master. So here is a natural relation between God and us. He, our creator, we, his creatures. He, our superior, and we, 
his inferiors, by reason of his authority and eternal right. And God may urge this, I am the Lord, though he do not urge that. I am the Lord, thy God. Sometimes I am the Lord, Leviticus 18, his own sovereignty. Sometimes the Lord, thy God, in verse 2, which argues our choice and consent to choose him for our God. Therefore thou art not free. Third reason, actual consent and resolution on our part is required that the sense of our duty may be more explicit upon our heart. Second Chronicles 30, yield yourselves to the Lord. In the original, it says, give the Lord the hand. That is, strike hands with him. Enter into covenant with him. Say, Lord, I will be for thee and thou for me. Choose him for your portion. And give up yourselves to be the Lord's people. Romans 12.1 Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He alludes to the Eucharistical sacrifices. All our offerings must not be sin offerings, but thank offerings. So, present yourselves. Under the law, a man, he brought his thank offering and laid his hand upon it. Lord, I am thine. It was implied in your baptism. And it is but reason that you should own your baptismal vow when you come to years of discretion. A bargain that is made for an heir during his non-age is confirmed by him when he comes to age. You were dedicated to God's service when you were young and knew not what you did. Now, when you come to choose your own way and at years of discretion, you should stand to what was done in your name to God. Therefore, there must be a serious and solemn consent of your heart. Fourth reason, it is for your profit to choose the strictest engagements, not only to approve the ways of God, but purpose, not only to purpose, but to put it into a promise or declared resolution, and not only resolve, but bind this resolution by an oath. Why? For you have more reason to expect God's assistance this way than any other, because this is the appointed means practiced by all the people of God when they expected the grace of the covenant. Surely God's blessing is best expected in his own way, and the greatest engagement to God, the more apt to hold us to our duty than a looser engagement. Fifth reason, consider the necessity as well as the profit. Laziness is the cause of our backwardness and hanging off from God. We are loath to come to God. Our off and on hang between heaven and hell. We have many loose and wavering thoughts until we come to a firm purpose and determination. But that engageth the heart. Jeremiah 30.21 Who is this that engages his heart to draw nigh to me? We are weak and wavering in our purposes and wishes, but it puts an end to this when we come to a full and firm purpose. Acts 11.23, he exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Austin in his confessions tells us how he would daily, how he would dally with God and how long he struck in the new birth until he was resolved, until he bound himself firmly to shake off all his carnal source courses and mind the business of religion. Because of our fickleness and the strength of temptations that will draw us off from God, he that is not resolved cannot be constant. James 1.8, the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Christians, when an unconstant and rebelling heart meets with temptation without all our wishes and cold purposes will come to nothing and be unstable in all our ways. But when we are firmly and habitually resolved, then Satan is discouraged. While we are thinking and deliberating what we shall do, the devil hath some hope of us. We lie open to temptation. But when he seeth a bent of the heart is fixed and settled 
and we have firmly bound ourselves to God, his hopes are gone. He that is in a wavering condition is easily overborne when temptation comes. But a fixed man is safe. Papers, feathers, and things that lie loose upon the ground are tossed up and down by every blast and puff of wind. Those things that are fastened to the ground, though the wind blows never so strongly, they remain. Many set out towards the ways of salvation, but are discouraged and turn back again into a course of sin. But when you solemnly give up yourselves to God, then you will not have so many temptations as before. Look as Naomi was ever dissuading Ruth that she should not be a companion with her in her sorrows, but go back to her own country. When she saw that she was resolved and steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left off speaking with her. Ruth 1, verse 18. Or let me take another instance in Acts 21, 14. The disciples were persuading Paul that he should not go to Jerusalem. Though they did even break his heart, they could not break his purpose. But when they saw that he was so set, that he went bound in the Spirit, then they said, The will of the Lord be done. Thus will tempters be discouraged from importuning and setting upon us to draw us off from God when once our bent is fixed. By resolution we are quickened to more seriousness and diligence. For when once we come under the bond of a holy oath, the awe of an oath will still be upon us and quicken us to more diligence and seriousness, to make a business of religion, whereas otherwise we make but a recreation in the sport of it, and but a business by the by. Psalm 27, 4, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. When we have laid firm bonds upon ourselves, this makes us full of awe, serious, and resolute in a course of obedience. Thus it directeth us to resolve for the manner of entering. First, it must be a resolution of heart rather than of the tongue. Jeremiah 30, verse 21, Who is this that engageth his heart to seek the Lord? Acts 11:23. He exhorted them that with purpose of heart they should cleave unto the Lord. Resolutions are not determined by the tenor of our language so much as by the bent of the heart. Therefore, empty promises signify nothing unless they be the result of our very souls and not only of a natural conscience. Deuteronomy 5.29 The people did not dissemble, certainly when the Lord appeared to them by the sound of a trumpet and those mighty earthquakes. But saith the Lord, Oh, that there were such a heart in them to fear me always. That there were a heart. And such a heart, that is, that this were not merely the result of an awakened conscience, but the resolution of a renewed heart. So in Psalm 78, 37, their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. Surely they did not dissemble in their distress, but their heart was not right with him. That is... It was not a sanctified heart. It was only the dictate of an awakened conscience for the present. Second resolve, when you thus engage yourself to God, let it not be a weak, broken, but full resolution. Cold wishes are easily overcome by the love of the world and a half purpose. Acts 26, 28, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Carnal men, although they are not converted, yet they have a kind of half turn almost, but not altogether. Upon a lively sermon or in sickness, they have their purposes and wishes, but it is not a full, strong bent of heart, and love must be a serious bent. First Chronicles 22.19, Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Third resolve, it must not be a wish, but a serious resolution such as is advised all difficulties well weighed. In a fit and pang of devotion, men will resolve for God, but it will never hold. Joshua 24, 19, Ye cannot serve the Lord, for He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. 
he will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. And therefore you must reckon what it is to serve this holy God. You must sit down and count the charges, what it is likely to cost you, that this dedication of yourselves to God may be grounded upon serious consideration. Do you know what lust of the flesh you must renounce? What interest of yours you must lay at his feet? Fourth resolve, it must be a thorough, absolute, and perfect resolution. Whatever it costs, as he that sold all for the pearl of price. In Matthew 13. A marriage even made may be broken off. Some will take up religion by way of essay to try how they like it, as men go to sea for pleasure, but will not launch out so far into the deep, but that they may be sure easily to get to shore again. But a man for a voyage resolves upon all weathers. So whatever disappointment, here is my business, thus will I do, and though he should kill me, yet will I trust in him. Job 13. Fifth resolve, it must be a resolution for the present, not for the future. For all resolutions for the future are false. Psalm 27, 8, when thou saidst, seek ye my face, like a quick echo, my heart answered, thy face, Lord, will I seek. And we must resolve so to engage presently, for what we do for hereafter is but a cheat we put upon ourselves, merely to elude the workings of heart to avoid the present impulse. Sixth, it must be a resolution according to the covenant of grace. In a sense of our insufficiency and dependence upon Christ, not in a confidence of our own strength. Peter went forth in a confidence of his own resolution and how soon did he miscarry. Therefore, we must resolve in the strength of God. Psalm 119.8 I will keep thy precepts O forsake me not utterly. If God forsake, all will come to nothing. Thus should we solemnly dedicate ourselves to his use and service. Having entered into such solemn engagement to be the Lord's, keep this covenant and oath made with God for these motives. From the nature of such a solemn engagement, it hath more in it than a single promise. There is in every solemn dedication or vowing of ourselves to God an attestation or calling upon God to take witness, and there is an invocation, an attestation, a calling God to witness of our serious intentions to perform. Will you call God to be witness to a lie? And an imprecation, calling upon God to punish us if we do the contrary. Therefore, being entered into the bond of such an holy oath, how should we tremble to break? For he that renews his oath of allegiance to God, he doth as it were, dare God to do his worst. For you thereby wish some heavy plague to fall upon your heads if you do not fulfill the duty of your oath. That is, he that eats and drinks of the body and blood of Christ unworthily he is guilty of damnation, guilty of the Lord's blood. Because these solemn rites do not only con confirm the promises, but confirm the threatening. And there is implied not only an invocation of blessing, but an imprecation upon ourselves. That is, if you do not fulfill the duty of the covenant, you offer yourselves, as it were, to God's curse. Consider the tenderness of God's people in case of any oath or solemn promise, though it concerned their duty to man. Joshua 9:19 and 20, it is spoken of the league with the Gibeonites. We have sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel, now therefore we may not touch them, lest wrath be upon us, because of the oath which we swear unto them. They looked upon it as horrible impiety to break an oath. Now, much more doth this hold in our engagements to God. Shall we not look upon it as a horrid impiety to break a solemn oath so solemnly renewed, and our faith so solemnly plighted, Every sin of ours is made the more heinous because of this oath. Remember the great quarrel that God hath against the Christian world and all the professors of his name is about his covenant and oath taken. 
What is the reason God doth visit Christendom with famines, pestilences, inundations, and wars? Because they do not stand to the oath of God that is upon them. Every professor of the name of Christ, he is supposed to be in covenant with God. Hebrews 10.29, of how much sore punishment shall he be thought worthy, who hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing. All visible professors of Christianity are under a covenant with God to take God for their God and to live as his people. Now, because of their looseness and profaneness, they do not stand to their engagement. Therefore, so many plagues are upon them. Close with Leviticus 26.25 I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. That is, because they did not perform the duties sworn to him. Would you stand with me for prayer? We thank thee, Heavenly Father, for thy word this day. Thou hast given it to us through the faithful writing of one of thy servants. And through the inspired works of the scriptures which we hold so dear to have in our possession. We pray, O Lord, that the ordinances of thy gospel would not be hindered by the weakness of our flesh, that we would not stumble one another with our pride, selfishness, or love of the world. We ask that thou would preserve and send forth thy precepts from us in all their purity and power. These are pearls of great price. They have everlasting value. Help us to proclaim liberty to those captivated by sin. Create in us hearts that are clean, hearts that are inclined to perform thy statutes always. Accept our vows, O Lord, even the free will offerings of our mouths. Let these press upon us daily our duty and our love to our Savior. For it is in his name that we are allowed in thy presence today. Amen. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. You are welcome to make copies and give them to those in need. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. It is likely that the sermon or book that you just listened to is also available on cassette or video, or as a printed book or booklet. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com by phone at 780-450-3730 by fax at 780-468-1096 or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue Edmonton that's E-D-M-O-N-T-O-N Alberta abbreviated capital A capital B Canada T6L3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 731, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle was adopted by the Papists, all those fictitious modes of worship, 
in which they absurdly exercise themselves, would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important. When he says that God had commanded no such thing, and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.